Hello, welcome back to our podcast. Today, we have the honor of hosting a truly exceptional guest, a trailblazer in the field of biomedical research. Driven by a passion for science, our guest's groundbreaking work has left an incredible mark on the research community. She is a scientific executive with a demonstrated history of leadership in the research in NIH. She is a translational scientist skilled in genomics, pharmacogenetics, gene-targeted therapies and precision medicine, clinical research, and rare diseases. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our esteemed guest today, Dr. Joni L. Rudder. Thank you, Satwick. It's so nice to be here today, and a shout out to all of you there in Richmond, Virginia. Hello, everyone. Hello. So why don't you tell us about like what you do? All right. Well, uh, boy, it's hard to put that really in a nutshell. Every day is different uh, for what I do. Um, but uh, I work at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, that's where we, where we, uh, our headquarters are in Bethesda, Maryland. And the National Institutes of Health, also called NIH, is um, it's a place where there are 27 different institutes and centers. And one of those centers is the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. I we kind of affectionately re refer to it as NCATS because it's easier to say. Um, but uh, we're very focused on translational science. And if you know anything about NIH, it's um, it's a place where a lot of um, uh, basic and foundational science is conducted across the country. We support a lot of the research across the country uh, through grants and contracts and, and other kinds of, of, of ways of, of providing resources to do so. And we also have um, um, sort of an intramural collection of laboratories within the NIH. And NCATS has its own lab here as well. And so uh, not only do we provide money across the country to do research in a variety of areas in biomedical research, uh, we also do a lot of the research here in-house. Um, and uh, NCATS is a place where we study translational sciences. And so you might ask, well, what are translational sciences? And, and, and really, um, it's, 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 it's kind of simple explanation. We, we, basic science is when we're, we're trying to find discovery of, of you know, using um, a variety of different uh, biomedical disciplines, biology, genetics, cellular biology, physics, bioinformatics, um, and these different types of approaches to answer research questions, um, like why do people get disease? Why do people get a specific disease? Um, and what genes might be involved in those particular diseases. So that's a lot of the, the foundational research that NIH supports. Um, and, and what translational science does is once there's a finding um, within that, that basic science space, uh, translational science is really about pulling that finding and then turning it into a health solution. So maybe we can find a, a particular compound or drug or therapeutic that might be effective uh, for the original research that was conducted in, in, the, in the basic laboratories. And then that's the translational piece that we work on. And then we hand that off to clinical research to do clinical trials um, and ultimately get this into, um, uh, into patients. And so that's really our goal is to turn research observations into health solutions. And our goals are to bring more treatments for all people more quickly. So that's that's essentially what we're trying to do with translational science. But I want to give just one example. Um, it, it when you think about translational science, and it it, it really covers a, a huge um, sort of ground in in that term. But when you think about mathematics, when you're in school, you you would have a when I was in school, maybe I should say. Let me clarify. Mm. When I was in school, it was a it was a, a slate and chalkboard. You know, we used chalk and erasers. Um, but we did mathematics, we did it on the chalkboard. Okay, so we also had calculators. But the translational science piece was actually moving to make uh, doing or calculating mathematics. Uh, by having a calculator, we were able to do mathematics faster, better, and more efficiently. And so it's sort of this automated way in which we can now do a lot of our are a, a very you know basic uh, calculations by using a, a a calculator. So going from chalk and and uh, you know chalkboard to a calculator that 
that whole transition of moving to something that's more automated that can be done more effectively and efficiently, that's kind of what translational science is all about. And so we're trying to find all of the calculators for then many different diseases that are out there. So that's kind of what uh, translational science is all about. Mm -hmm. So how did you get interested in translational science? Like what piqued your interest in this subject? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, I think I was a geneticist by training and uh, I also had training in pharmacology and toxicology. Um, and, but I really spent a lot of my time doing a lot of genetic studies and I would um, be involved in projects where we would have particular diseases that were genetic diseases that we were working on. And our goal was to find the particular gene that was responsible for creating the pathogenesis underlying that disease. So what was the gene that caused the disease? And through genetic studies, we, we have very good tools in our ability to find genes that cause the disease, but it takes time or, and, and it takes less time nowadays because we have more and better tools. Um, but my experience uh, doing genetics and, and working on those projects is that we might be very successful in finding a particular gene that caused the disease. And then our project was done as, a, as the geneticist on that project, our project was done. And we handed it off to a team of, of, of other um, scientists. Sometimes we knew who these, those were, sometimes we didn't. And uh, what I found was that I, I, I was very frustrated just from going uh, to find genes for a particular disease. And then I'd go to another project for, to find the gene for the particular disease. I was wielding the same tool. And that's not a bad thing. But what I found was that that the lack of connection to then moving the understanding of what we found from the genetic findings to then moving into a therapy, it, 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 lo it got lost in translation, so to speak. And so what better place than to be is to uh, land in a spot where we're actually thinking about that translational aspect and moving things from then genes that might cause diseases to then thinking more about how we can find treatments for those diseases. So that's that's really how I landed where I am. Um, but I'll say the other part of it was, uh, I, I don't know that I woke up one morning, you know, when I was in high school and said, hey, I want to be a director of NCATS. Um, it wasn't quite that direct. And um, I spent a lot of time time in the lab, but it turned out I was pretty good at thinking more strategically and thinking a little bit bigger picture. And, and that's how I landed in more of the sort of outside of the lab role and, um, and, and thinking about how we can apply some of these tools and, and help the research community uh, work together with them to, to move science forward. So that sounds interesting. So how would you say that other people could also get into this field, like other high schoolers? Yeah. Um, if you want to get into this field, I, I think, um, you know, uh, in translational science, it's it's really about team science and the multidisciplinary approaches to what you need to do in team science. So I talked a lot about genetics, but the genetics wasn't the only piece that was there to help me find how to find particular drugs and therapies. We needed pharmacologists, toxicologists. We needed physicians, clinicians. We need basic scientists, informaticians, data scientists. So we really need a variety of um, key people who know those various disciplines and who can speak the language, take the time to speak the language of a few other disciplines to be able to talk to one another and understand what the problems are that we're trying to solve. And so if you're in high school, thinking about a career in biology or chemistry or physics, you know, the main kinds of scientific platforms, um, you know, th those are those are really good um, uh, disciplines to pursue, but you don't always have to be in science. If you're in an English uh, major in, in uh, high school or liking English in high school and wanna be an English major in college um, because that's part of your passion. Well, it turns out that a lot of what we do as scientists is in communication. And so actually being uh, proficient in, in um, ways of communicating that they teach you through, uh, through various languages is also an important uh, discipline too. So it depends on what you're interested in, but the, but the big factor is, is that if you're interested in helping people um, in healthcare, helping people live better lives, et cetera, 
for um, for health and not disease, um, then you know certainly science is is certainly a landing spot that you'll be in. But it requires a bunch of dis different disciplines to interact and be a part of a team that can help uh, sort of raise all boats and move things forward in advance. So really, it's about doing what you like and and not worrying necessarily about what discipline you're in because that discipline will be needed for uh, all, all aspects of what we're doing in biomedicine. So you said that there would be lots of people who you work with. How would you say that this has impacted your like teamwork and communication skills? Yeah, it's really important. It turns out that, you know, sometimes it's uh, uh, when you're just starting out in science, you're kind of afraid to tell people your ideas or you're kind of afraid to tell someone, well, you, you think that may not work, their experiment may not work, or you think that your experiment may not work. Um, or you're afraid to say that, you, that perhaps your experiment didn't work and now you don't quite know what to do. Um, and working with a team, it is sort of in a way helping you bounce ideas off of someone else who comes at the problem from a different perspective. And they can often help you kind of get over that that uh, that worry of being afraid to tell somebody of, of what you're thinking or something that didn't work, um, because they might say, oh, well, have you tried to do something different? And they might have thoughts on that. And and so that's the value, really, of, of that teamwork. And um, it turns out that sometimes people uh, have uh, they they may not know exactly what you're doing, but they have a way of helping you solve the problem that you have. And sometimes they might have a, a problem that they don't really know what to do, but you might have the solution that they need. And so having those constant dialogues with, with peers who you're working with, that that's what makes the teamwork so valuable. And it creates that efficiency that is, is really what we, we seek um, because we're not as stagnant so long because we're always uh, bouncing ideas off of each other in that team science environment. What role would you say that you play most of the time in this uh, team environment? Yeah, uh, I, I would say probably the biggest role that I play is around communication. Um, I talk to a lot of people about what what we do and how we can provide particular resources where people might be stuck and um, for, for example, um, there are there are over 10,000 diseases, for example, and we only have 5% of those diseases have a therapy. So 95% of diseases out there don't have a therapy. That's a big space. Um, and so a lot of times uh, we work with, with people who have um, particular diseases. We work a lot with people with rare diseases, for example, rare diseases, there are over 10,000 rare diseases alone, um, let alone all diseases together, there are over 10,000 all, all, all told, but uh, over 10,000 rare diseases. So when we're talking with families and patients and researchers who are working on rare diseases, it's oftentimes just raising awareness that we have these resources in that team environment, we have something that they might be able to use and also we look forward to learning how they're approaching their particular problem in a rare disease so that we can then adopt that and help others as well. Um, so a lot of what I do in the team environment space is really to, to, to raise awareness and to talk about some of the resources that we have that might be helpful to a variety of families, patients, and, and researchers out there. What would you say your favorite part about your job is? <laughs> uh, my favorite part of the job is working with all the people I get to work with. Um, we have a fantastic team here at NCATS, a lot of creative people, and it's a very rich team environment. Um, and so we talk a lot about, um, you know, how we can approach things a little bit differently. Sometimes we, we're, a, we're a little bit on the side of, uh, you know, uh, ha, ha, we've done it this way for too long and, you know, 5% of therapies for treatments, maybe we need to think about how to re-engineer the, the pipeline for developing therapeutics. And so that's a lot about what we talk about. Um, so that's, uh, that's the fun part of my job is being able to talk to people to understand, you know, really what the needs are um, and how perhaps we can approach things a little bit differently. Um, and, and it really is bringing the, the communities together of, 
of the scientists that, that we work with here at NCATS, but also the scientists in pharmaceutical industries and in biotech, in academia, and in different organizations who are working with patients directly. Um, you know, that's the real value because the learnings that we can get from understanding what people are facing help us understand how we can best meet their needs. Um, and so that's that's the challenge. It's an opportunity. Um, and it's a really fun part of the job that we get to do. And when we're successful, that's the rewarding part. Mm -hmm. So you said that you work a lot with rare diseases. So what are some diseases that you've worked with in the past? Yeah, so um, there have been a couple of diseases I've worked with in the past, but um, uh, some in particular are hereditary um, cancers like breast cancer, um, uh, breast cancers caused by a particular gene. Um, and uh, same with ovarian cancers. I've also worked with melanoma as a cancer and, and hereditary melanoma are, are pretty rare. Um, I've also worked with a couple of um, neurogenetic disorders, something called neurofibromatosis type two um, and a variety of other um, different types of rare diseases. And now of course, I like to say that I work on all rare diseases because the, the kind of work that we do now is not um, with translational science being the theme, we don't have a particular disease that we focus on. We can focus on a variety of rare diseases. And so the work that we do, it's actually thinking about uh, what, are, what are some platforms that we can build to help uh, raise all boats for all diseases. And um, if, if, we can, if we can find ways to make science more efficient, more effective, and even more predictive, then, then we could really get a jump start on a variety of different rare diseases. So even though before in the past I was working on single diseases, now I feel like I'm working on on all the diseases. But it's it's with a huge team here at NCATS within our research community. So many people involved in all of this, and so uh, so that's really a, a fun part of it too. Mm -hmm. So what would you say are some like stressors that you experience every day on the job? Yeah, the biggest stressor I have is is uh, right now we don't really have a budget um, in the federal government. Uh, we have we're on what's called a continuing resolution, and we get funded in the federal government. We get funded every year, um, so each year we get a new budget, and uh, and, and so uh, sometimes when things get delayed uh, in terms of of getting our budget, then we're able to uh, we're able to maintain what we're doing, but we're not able to necessarily do. Um, more things. And so right now we're kind of waiting for our, our budget to come out this year. It was supposed to happen in October, um, but it's been a busy year. Um, and so we're we're continuing to wait for, for our budget. That's one of the biggest stress, stressors, I think, um, in my position, because it's um, it, it, it creates sometimes a little bit of lag and delay. Um, but at the same time, we're still able to push forward on stuff that we're doing and continue to do the good work that we do. Um, so that's that's one thing. I think the other stressor that that is is apparent is um, we're not able to do everything that we'd like to do, and sometimes that can be very frustrating. Um, either just because of resources, or or because we don't quite have the technology we need. Um, we're constantly trying to develop new technologies and and make things more predictive, um, and so finding the balance of of that technology development also with kind of where we need to keep pushing on, on what we know how to do well, um, that sometimes can be, sometimes can be a struggle. Mm -hmm. Not bad stressors though. These are not too bad. Yeah. The job sounds pretty stress-free. Yeah. To yeah. A lot of other jobs. I wouldn't say it's stress-free, but, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not bad in, in terms of, you know, really when you get to think about it at the end of the day, what have you done at the end of the day that's going to help uh, some patient out there or many patients out there with a disease? That's a that's that's something that that's our goal, um, right? Is to help people who who are sick, and um, if there's a way that we can um, ease some of that uh, for their life, we may not be able to cure them, but if we can slow things down, um, you know, that's that's a win. And and um, so at the end of the day. You know, that's uh, keeping that in, in our forefront, that sort of helps with those stressors. Mm -hmm. So out of the diseases that you've worked with, what would you say would 
probably be your favorite to like learn about and to like try and help slow down or find a cure? Oh gosh, there are too many to to name. So I I, I don't think I can I can name one. Um, but um, you know, given that there are over ten thousand rare diseases, I think if we can slow down the any one of those or any several of those, um, that would be a huge win. Um, I'll, my mother had a rare disease called myelofibrosis, and uh, and. And that's kind of what made me very interested in in rare diseases. And with with her disease, um, there were no treatments at the time. She this was uh, several years ago now. Um, there were no treatments, and and there were clinical trials, but she would have to travel either you know a full day, eight hours on an airplane, or or she'd have to drive many hours by car to get to the uh, the clinic that was doing the clinical trial. And she just wasn't willing to do that. And um, over time, uh, she passed. And very recently, there was a new drug that was approved for the disease she had. And um, so, so it's it, it, NCATS didn't have a role in that particular um, therapy for that disease. But to see that the the there are the biomedical ecosystem, the industry, biopharmaceutical companies are really pushing on these rare diseases um, to, to bring treatments to people is really important. And um, so that made me really happy to see that happen in our, um, in, in, in sort of the work that we do. And, and so what I like to think about is, is looking at rare diseases as a bigger kind of question. What are the things that we can do in rare diseases that might be really helpful? And it turns out that you know, I mentioned 10,000 disease, diseases, over 10,000 rare diseases. Well, about 80% of rare diseases are caused by single gene mutations. So there's this genetic, very clear genetic link to the different rare diseases that are out there. And because we know that there is a genetic link to those diseases that tells us, well, maybe we don't need to focus on just one disease, why don't we focus on all of those that have that genetic link, all those 80%. And then if we can understand how to fix the genetic underlying genetic problem, that would really be valuable. So one of the projects that we work on here at NCATS is something called gene therapy and gene editing. And it's a way to um, think about actually fixing the very particular gene that's causing a rare disease. It, 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 it's not necessarily available for all of them, but uh, we're working towards a way that we can make a platform so that it can be available for as many of them as possible. And what we've done is we've taken a, a page out of the viral handbook. You know, when you get, we just went through a pandemic, um, so we all know what viruses are, but um, this particular virus is called AAV, adeno-associated virus. And it, it's, it's fairly benign in terms of, uh, of what it can do to a person. And so what we've done with that virus is we've taken the virus itself, but we've, we've made it in such a way where we've taken the viral DNA out of the virus. And what we can do now is take the gene that, is, that might be um, mutated in a particular person that's causing a rare disease and we can put the gene that's the, the functional copy of that gene into the virus capsid as its DNA. And then we can infect people with that virus and it's essentially giving the functional copy of the gene that's defective in them. And by doing so, um, the virus does what it does well. It infects these cells and it, and it leash, unleashes its DNA. And then the host cell takes over processes from there and can create proteins that are actually functional from it. So um, that's essentially what gene therapy is. And so what we're trying to do is to develop that viral capsid that allows us to put as many different copies of the, um, the functional copies of the genes that we know are defective out there that could benefit from this type of an approach. And we're understanding how to build that platform so that it can be available for more diseases. 
And now we have the technology to do gene editing, where it's not just replacing a whole gene, it's actually just just cutting out the mutation and replacing it with the right um, the right um, DNA uh, that's 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 incorrect in the in the genome. So we have more and more tools that we're able to use in thinking about how to how to treat rare diseases in a much more broad way and can affect much more of the rare disease um, uh, rare diseases that are out there. Mm -hmm. So recently they also came out with CRISPR. Yeah. I don't remember how recently that was, but that was pretty recent. Uh, have you guys started using it or do you plan on using it anytime soon? We use it all the time. Yes. Um, we have this uh, program and, and it's very much like what I just talked about. Um, it was This program is called the Somatic Cell Gene Editing Program. And CRISPR came out in 2012. Um, was when the first paper came out, and then of course the the um, uh, the group who who studied that Jennifer Doudna Doudna is 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 one of the leads in this group and quite famous for it. Uh, she won a uh, Nobel Prize um, as well. So um, it's it's really it has been a field uh, along with gene therapy. It has been a field that has moved amazingly fast, um, and there's there's quite a bit of promise, I think, with that. And and with CRISPR technology, that's the, the bit I was talking about where you can actually go into a person's uh, cell in their, in their um, particular tissue that's affected by a disease and you can clip out the, the mutation that is creating the disease and you can replace it with the right, uh, the right DNA. And that is a really valuable tool. Um, and the difficulty that we have now is how to get it into the people, into the right organs and the right cells in those people. And so that's the, the, the research that's being conducted now. Um, there's a little bit of, of uh, infidelity in how it fixed different places within the DNA, not only does it fix the particular mutation, but there might be other places in the genome that it might um, also uh, change as well. And so we wanna make sure that we're uh, ha increasing the fidelity of how well uh, the CRISPR-like approaches can work and that's getting better and better every day. And so we support um, a lot of that work that's, that's getting done there. And there are a variety of biotech companies out there and companies that are now starting to use this technology. And I hope that that will add just to the suite of, of different types of tools that we can use for treatments for rare diseases. But I think it's also gonna hold promise for people with common diseases too. Um, they can be affected by a variety of genetic uh, uh, impacts for common diseases, but they're, 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 they can be very different. And, and so the heterogeneity, the uh, one person might have a, a certain set of mutate or uh, changes in their DNA that that might lead to a disease, and another person might have a different set of changes in the DNA that lead to the same like disease, but it's not quite clear that it's the same disease. So we're learning about how we can use this technology for certainly rare diseases, but we think that it might be also useful for common diseases too. That's interesting. We're a ways away. We're a ways mm -hmm. away. But yeah. It's promising. Yeah. So how would you say that it makes you feel that you're saving all these people's lives by doing these researches on diseases and finding ways to prevent and cure them? Yeah, it's, it, it, there's, I think, nothing more um, rewarding than uh, having that as your, as your goal, as your North Star, to be able to think that at the end of the day, you're able to help someone. Um, and the the truth of the matter is that you know it does take it, it does take quite a long time it can take 10 to 15 years for that whole process to happen so uh, i talk about the work that we do in translational science that's the that takes a long time 10 to 15 years to get something into the clinic and the other difficulty about that truth is that 90% of the time it fails so it's got a very high failure rate. So what we're trying to do is understand how we can address the failure rate, how we can make things more predictive along that process um, so that 
that we can, um, you know, be more successful at the end of the day. But, you know, I have to say that that we have now, you know, a little over 50 different uh, drugs that that we helped to get approval into uh, into working into clinical trials. And uh, several of those have been successful for actually being drugs that are now approved and out there being used. Um, and, and knowing that we've had a hand in that along the way is, is really gratifying. But I think more so it's really seeing the success of, um, you know, the teams that we work with, all of the different people within the community and the families that, that we're able to support um, and, and showing that, that what we do is actually working and we need to keep going. That's interesting. So who would you say are some people that you have worked with? with NIH. Yeah, with NIH, um there uh, I work with a lot of people at NIH. Mm -hmm. Um so in a, in a way we uh, the work that we do in translational science is as I mentioned it's team science and that means that we don't necessarily do anything on our own. We we, we it's sort of a requirement that we work with other people. Mm -hmm. Um and and that that starts at you know thinking about a project and then that continues into actually doing the project, completing the project. Um, so it's it's a commitment that we make um, in, in doing so. But we've worked with a variety of people across the NIH. Um, uh, some people you might know of, like Francis Collins, who's no longer here at the NIH, but he's still continuing to do a lot of the work in rare diseases specifically. Um, working with a, a variety of people um, at the National Cancer Institute to work on various different projects. Um, also related to um, drug development and therapeutics. We do a lot of work in um, data science and informatics. Um, so we work with a, a variety of people at the National Library of Medicine and the Office of Data Science and Strategies at the NIH. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it is really multidisciplinary in terms of the people we work with and the different groups we work with. Um, but but really, it's so important for us that that even though we work with a lot of our colleagues here at the NIH, we're still very focused on the people that we're trying to help. So learning and listening to stories from communities, patient communities, and families, um, that's really critical to the work that we do. And and to the extent that we can bring them in when we have meetings and conversations, we do because that's uh, that that we hear about the stories and the needs that they have, and that helps us try to meet those needs. And the best way to do that is to work with a variety of our colleagues that can help us as well. So, what would you say are some of the your favorite companies that you've worked with? <laughs> um, I every company that we work with is my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, you know, uh, we work with a variety of uh, pharmaceutical companies. Um, and we work with a variety of biotech companies. Um, most of our interactions are with academic organizations and universities out there uh, doing a variety of the translational science research. And, and um, they do this in the rare disease space and they do this in sort of the clinical trials space and, and, and infrastructure development. But probably one of my favorite partnerships that I have, um, if I have to pick one, Satwick, if I have to pick a partnership mm -hmm. that I'm really excited about, um, is one that we have with um, the the with NASA, and it's 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 one of my favorite partnerships because I I you may not think that um, that what we do is is rocket science because it's not, but we use rockets for our science. Um, and so maybe this is a time where I could actually show one of my slides if that would be all right. Okay. Um, and let me just pull it up here so that I can uh, I can show it to you and 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 show you why I think that this is so important um, in in terms of what we do. Can you see that all right? Yeah, I can see that. So um, in, in in what we do, um, with NASA, we have these partnerships where we put patient cells, um, uh, something called induced pluripotent stem cells, on these little chips. And I'm holding one over here. Um, this is one of those tissue chips. This is a this is a tissue chip that's looking at heart or cardiac cells. And we can actually in these in these um, tissue chips, we can see the the cells beating, and we can measure 
uh, when those cells beat and for how long they beat. And so when we send these cells up into space, what we have learned is that within actually just a few days, we start to see some atrophy in how those cells beat, some deficiencies. They, they don't function as well as they, sh they should. Um, and it turns out that in the space environment, um, the microgravity environment actually creates more inflammatory kinds of pathology in different cell types. And we think that that's a lot of what's behind here, but we can actually measure that uh, when we send these cells up into space. And so this is one of those um, times when I was at, at uh, the Kennedy Center uh, Space Station uh, and uh, uh, watching one of the rockets launch uh, this actual tissue chip that went up into space. And so um, we send them up on these rockets and they go into the space station and they're there for about um, 30 days or so. And then they come back in the capsules, they splash down and we retrieve them from the ocean. And then we um, were able to do uh, uh, then the research that we really need to do on that. Um, but the astronauts out in the space station, here's one of the astronauts, Astro Katie, doing one of the experiments here um, with our tissue chips. Um, so, so this is, um, uh, uh, we, we've done this over the last uh, 10 years or so, and we're, we'll continue to do this kind of work. Um, but that's, I think, one of the exciting things, because when we've worked with NASA, we started out with kind of a, a pretty big, uh, maybe a desktop computer monitor size uh, tissue chip. And working with NASA and their engineers, here again, this team science thing comes back. But working with their engineers, um, they've helped us to really um, make the tissue chips much smaller. And the footprint is really important. When you send things up into space on the space station, you don't want to take up a lot of space. Um, and so it's important to have um, a, a way that uh, something that's actually manageable in size. And so I have a little example here. This is, this is uh, one of the tissue chips. This is called a lung on a chip model, but you can put different cells on here. But the unique thing about this is that you can see how it kind of bends. This is a material that we're using with this um, because when you think about studying a lung, you want to know that you can breathe in and breathe out. And that and by using these flexible materials and putting the cells inside there, we can hook up a little vacuum that can create that suction and and um, and and create the environment of these cells where they're expanding and contracting. And then we can test a variety of different um, drugs or compounds to see how they interact with these cells. Um, if they're disease cells or if they're not disease cells, we can look at the differences there. So that's kind of one example. We have another example here. This is um, a vascularized, um, so it's got, it's got blood vessels and it's got um, kidney cells in it. And so we can look at kidney cells and, and blood vessels here at the same kind of tissue chip. And it's kind of got this plug and play module to it. So we can dictate what, um, what uh, media or compounds get infused when and where and for how long. <coughs> and then lastly, we have something called a multi-organ on a chip. Uh, so here we have five different uh, cell types on one particular chip. And so we can look at, at heart, we can look at lung, we can look at, uh, at neurons and muscles all at the same time when we're evaluating um, different cell types in the compounds that might be effective for those for, for particular therapeutic development. Um, so that's these are the kinds of tools that we're using these days. And the reason that that's important is because um, it, it turns out that we science really studies rodent models quite a bit. Um, and other types of animal models, um, but animals are not humans. So the more that we can uh, recapitulate the human cells in an environment that could reflect more of the biology that we have in environments that are important, um, that's what really helps with this. And with the microgravity environment and our, and our work with, with NASA, um, the reason that that's so important is because we've learned that when astronauts go up into space, uh, and they stay there for three months, six months, or, or even longer, they come back and they have a variety of, of, um, of issues with, uh, for example, muscle uh, degradation, 
um, heart, the, the, their heart, uh, it, it, cardiac muscles are a little bit weakened. Um, they might have kidney stones. So there might be a variety of problems. The bone density is different. Um, so gravity plays a pretty important role in our own physiology. Um, and so when we send these cells up into space, those cells automatically detect that they're in a microgravity environment and they start to respond to that. And so we can learn a little bit more about the aging process um, because when those astronauts go into space, they kind of age faster. Uh, when they come back on Earth, it turns out that they revert to normal. So the good thing is, is that they revert back, but um, it allows us to then use that knowledge to send these samples up into space and learn about, you know, what what is it that we can find out how these cells are 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 behaving in this environment and how can we apply that to diseases here on earth. So that's why I think that that partnership is, is one of the more exciting ones because it's, it really uh, has covers a lot of different territory, biomaterials, physics, engineering, biology. Um, and it's, and, and it, and it's uses rockets. So that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I would have never expected that you guys would have worked with NASA because it seems like two completely different things. Yeah, and, and that's the thing about the team science thing and, and really finding people who you just talk to and and uh, and when you when you when you see or hear so you know when you, we heard the astronauts were coming back on Earth and they had these these weird kind of things that are happening to them the bone density etc. Um, but that they reverted back to normal. Well, uh, gosh, ha what what happens in both of those processes and how can we find ways that we can use that? So, yeah, you never know where those kinds of ideas will come from. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else that you would like to add? Um, let's see. Is there anything else I'd like to add? Gosh, um, you know, I think I covered a lot. You helped me cover quite a bit of, mm -hmm. of territory here. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I'll say that just another vignette of, of perhaps a sort of an emerging technology that we're working on, which is also kind of fun, um, is is if I were to ask you, um, which animal do you think has the best sense of smell? What would you say? Um, I'm not sure, but I know that dogs have a pretty good sense of smell. Dogs have a pretty good sense of smell. You'd be right. So, um, it turns out that dogs have about 220 million scent receptors. And humans, by comparison, we have about 5 million scent receptors. <clears throat> so we're we're terrible, turns out. <laughs> but still we do okay, right? We, uh, it's, we do have a nose and we do smell things. But dogs have these smell receptors, not only do they have a lot of them, but they're 10,000 times more accurate than our own noses. So that's powerful enough for a dog to detect a substance at concentrations of one part per trillion, which is kind of the equivalent to a single drop of liquid in 20 different Olympic size swimming pools. So, so that's, that's pretty effective in terms of how those scent receptors are working. And they, the dogs also inhale 300 times per minute um, and so they're constantly getting this barrage of, of tickling those scent receptors. And um, that's why they're, you know, really trained to sniff out explosives. Uh, you know, probably what went through your thought process exactly is, you know, we have dogs trained out there that can find things. But we've also trained dogs to, to sense uh, somebody with COVID-19, somebody with cancer even. Um, and so it turns out that that we as humans, we um, we have these volatile compounds that come off our skin or we breathe out or we exhale. Um, and so there are ways in which we can then figure out how to detect um, different things within those 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 volatile compounds that we're that we're emitting. Now dogs are are good, but different breeds are different. You have to train them, you have to, you know, there's there's all sorts of things that we have to do to keep dogs in that in that way. And so one of the things that we're doing at NCATS is to think about, um, you know, another thing that we learned about the space is more from a science fiction movie called Star Trek. Um, and, you know, in Star Trek, they use these things called the tricorder, these little devices where they could 
you know, put in front of somebody who's not well, and then it would magically tell you what was wrong with them. We're definitely not quite there yet, but what we're trying to do at NCATS is uh, creating a, what we're calling a, a way to a device that could screen for conditions using this sort of electronic nose technology that we've learned from dogs. So I was, I was kind of hesitant to say that dogs are a good partner of ours because we don't really, you know, it's, we're not really partnering with them, but we're learning from them. And we're trying to um, understand the real kind of way in which they're able to, to be so effective in, in sniffing out um, a variety of different things. And so now we're creating devices that, that are able to scent different um, things like COVID-19, as I mentioned, um, and some people who may have long COVID, for example, um, dogs are able to sense these sorts of, of things. And, um, and now we're translating that into a technology or device that we'll be able to use. And so ultimately, again, we're going to need engineers and physicists and material uh, scientists to help us, you know, package those things into something that's more small smaller to get into like a tricorder like device. Um, but that's another area that we are that we're working in. Um, and so I think that, you know, what what I really enjoy about translational science is is just the variety of disciplines that we interact with, um, whom we learn from, and and ultimately the variety of different kinds of conditions and diseases that we can help. And the and the patients who have them, um, you know, that that's really our big goal. Um, so those, the, the, that would be the last thing I wanted to tell you is that last vignette is, is, you know, technology development is pretty important in this whole, in this whole thing of, of even working in the disease space and, and trying to find therapies that help, help people. Technologies are going to help um, identify and diagnose. They're also going to help deliver those, those uh, therapeutics. So we, we need a lot more of those uh, um, high school uh, high school people who are interested in these areas to continue that learning and perhaps go into a field of translational science to help that out. Okay. Well then, uh, I guess we're done for today. All right. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate the time and uh, uh, it was really a fun conversation, Sadwick. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that concludes another insightful episode of our podcast. And a special thank you to you, Dr. Rudder, for sharing your invaluable expertise and passion for research. And as we navigate the ever-evolving landscape of science and technology, remember, curiosity is the compass that guides us. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep pushing the boundaries of knowledge. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast. This is Sawick signing off.